Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to New Books in East Asian Studies, a podcast series on New Books Network. My name is Hui Ying Chen, and I'm here as one of the hosts on the channel. Today, it is our greatest pleasure to welcome Dr. Zhang Xing with his newest book, The Global in the Local, a Century of War, Commerce, and Technology in China that published um, last month in 2023 by Harvard University Press. Welcome, Dr. Zhang. Thank you, Dr. Chen. My name is Zhang Xin in Chinese, but in America, we use the name of Xinjiang. So if you're looking for my book, it's X-I-N-Z-H-A-N-G. Okay, so um, you will not miss the books then. Um, so our first question to start off, um, let's get to know you a little bit. So would you like to share a few words about yourself, your background, or anything you would like to introduce to our audience here at New Books Network? Sure. I was born in China, and I came to the United States in 1984. And I was fortunate to partake in the national examination after the Cultural Revolution was over, and I passed it. So I got into a university and studied history in China, and I came here after I graduated from China, Chinese University, and I studied at the University of Chicago and got my PhD, and I, my, I majored in Chinese history. And ever since I graduated from University of Chicago, I've been teaching Chinese history, Asian history, and global history. And this book is one of the two books that I've published in English language. Thank you so much. So as you were mentioning about this book, um, so how did you come to write this particular book focusing on Zhenjiang, a medium-sized city in eastern China during the 19th and 20th centuries? In order to answer that question, I need to talk a little bit about what is going on in our field of Chinese history. In recent years, when I say recent years, I actually mean that since 1980s, most scholars who study China in the United States have begun very interested in what we called social history, and part of which is local history. I was trained as a social historian at the University of Chicago. That got me started with local history. But over the years, we've somehow transformed into more of a global historian because the field has moved away pretty much from the previous approach. And in the late 20th century, there was a great interest in post-colonialism, transnational history, both of which gave rise to what we call today global studies. But in the 21st century, we begin to understand a lot more about the globe. And I wanted to combine what I know best, which is the study of local history with the study of global history. That is the reason I decided to work on this book, which is titled The Global in the Local. And why Zhenjiang fits into this story? First, Zhenjiang is a medium-sized city. That is very true. A medium-sized city in China was not studied enough by Chinese historians because most people study big cities like Shanghai, Guang, Guangdong, and for them, well, part of that is the opening of the archives in those places. Secondly, it was a lot more convenient to access them if you go to the big cities. However, there is one thing that we need to think about is the what connects the big city with the vast majority of the country of China, which is the countryside. It is the medium-sized cities. And I saw that as kind of a vacuum and tried to 
feel that are welcome. That is the reason I picked Jinjiang. Yeah, thank you so much for explaining a little more to us why specifically Zhenjiang as an intermediary between larger cities or large sized cities and countryside, and also as a focused study to explore global in the local global history and local history. Um, and I want to follow up specifically on. Um, the history of medium-sized city that you were um, proposing in this book, and also mentioned a little bit already. So, how unique or representative is Zhenjiang as a medium-sized city in China? Okay, there are a few things that makes Zhenjiang, in a sense, of unique. Okay, number one. There are many. There are more cities like Zhenjiang than the cities like Shanghai or Guangdong. Number one. Number two. Zhenjiang is located in the place where the most prosperous region of China was, the Lower Yangtze region. In that region, for some reason, was. Not only the most prosperous, but also the most populated in China throughout most of its history. And Zhenjiang became my focus for other reasons. For example, during the 19th century, which is a period that I studied in this book, during the 19th century, Zhenjiang was invaded by the British, and secondly. Zhenjiang was the place where it felt a great deal of the transformation of Chinese commercial system, because it is if if we are looking at the trans the system of comm- uh, long distance trade in China, we could see that. During the period before the nineteenth century, most of the trade, long distance trade, was based upon the river system in China, and Zhenjiang was on the Yangtze River, was on the side south side of Yangtze River. On the other hand, it was on the major route between the north and south. So it was. Just the place where I can find a great deal of information about the transformation that took place in this particular place during the 19th century, because 19th century we know that there was a transformation of the long distance trade no longer depend upon the river system. So I want to see that transformation. Number three, because it was on the south side of Yangtze River, it was impacted immediately by the arrival of the first foreign and Western technology, steamboat. So I found this place fascinating because I th- I think that I can take advantage of this particular place. The uniqueness come from these three the main things. Let me add a little bit about these. What these three things really entail. These three things entail, as I see it, number one, modern imperialism, because when Zhenjiang was invaded, it was what we call the production of modern imperialism. We can see that. The second is the economic integration in the world. So Zhenjiang was caught in the middle of this international、uh, economic integration of the world. Number three, the technological transformation in the world, all of which the three of them actually had a lot to do with Western Europe and North America, which is the topic that we don't talk about or we were afraid to talk about before that period of time, but after the. 1980s, basically 1970s, 80s, because we got into China-centered approach, and after that we were we were so afraid of talking about that. Until recently, we are coming back to those questions. I want to tackle that question. So Zhenjiang is unique in the sense that I can take advantage of this place, the information, the history, the trajectory of this history, to show people how. 
China was transformed during 19th and early 20th century, which is the period that I covered for the book. As you um, already summarized for our audience, um, the three themed um, studies, the war, the commerce, and also the steamboat, um, is kind of what this book um, is composed of the three parts. And while we would not be able to cover um, all the chapters um, one by one here today, um, but we will spend a little time on each part and hear more from um, from Dr. Zhao. So to kind of start going back to the 19th century, the earliest um, encounter or collision or the first point you were talking about the Opium War. So part one, specifically, we are here focusing on part one, chapter three in the book, that how did the Opium War, a messy business, bring the Chinese local society specifically at Zhenjiang into quote-unquote negotiation with modern imperialism? And how did the war act as a negative form of liaison for both sides? Yes, thank you so much for mentioning the, the terms that I've used in this book. Yes, I do use the, I use, do use the term negotiation. What I want to emphasize is that it's not negotiation like what we do in trade, in business. It is more of a negotiation because the word negotiation has different connotations, one of which is that it, the people have to not only put up with it, but also they have to survive those changes. And on the other hand, they have to somehow, to some degree, they have to make changes of themselves in order to fit into those. Those changes could be disastrous. So this is how I present the case of negotiation between modern Chinese average people of China with the modern imperialism. I want to approach this from a perspective, first of all, of war. But I do not want to see a war. Of course, the word massive business is given by the theorists who wanted to say that a war is complicated. It has lots of consequences. Of course, we always use the term unintended consequence. Yes, war brings unintended consequences, but war brings direct consequences. Obviously, it is meant for destruction. So what I examined of that period of time was that when a foreign army that came from another continent and had nothing to do with China and forced themselves into Chinese territory. And the people in China, in this mid-sized city of Zhenjiang, had no idea about foreigners, let alone the idea about foreign troops and foreign uh, weaponry, none of that. All of a sudden, they have to face this foreign army with the m machine, with the steamship, with the cannon, with the gun, with all these things they, are, they have never seen before. And I, I want to show people how these people react to those kind of things. What I discover is this. Number one, which is a major part of that part of my book. I have three parts of the book. This is one of the book. I discovered that the woman massively commit to suicide in response to that. Chinese soldiers kill their wives, mothers, and daughters before they go fight the British. I found that. So lots of mercy killings and lots of suicides. That's something I found I found out. Lots of story about these things. And because I I use a diary a lot mostly for this part. The diaries that I use, I have the British diary, which means the British officer's diary. British soldiers didn't write diaries. I think they were not educated enough. To, they, were, they didn't have the, what, I, what I called wherewithal well, well to write those, you know, elaborate memoirs. But the officers did. They wrote them. And the Chinese wrote them. And 
it, it, what's interesting that the Chinese, the, 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 the contemporaries, which means the people who lived through this period of time, and some of whom were even in the city at the time, somehow wrote down those experiences about women. They, the Chinese, of course, didn't, didn't say that a woman committed suicide, but the British just say that. So all, all of that things. The other side of the story which is, I hope that my readers will be interested in reading the, these parts, is that it's not just the suicides. It's also after the battle was over, what happened? I had a lot of materials to show that looting was a big deal. What I discovered, I hope that the people will agree with what I say, is that I don't think there were enough of the research on this and there were enough of the publication that show what I have been showing is the looters. Who are they? Some of whom are neighbors. Some of whom are people living in the city. And many of whom came from the outside of city as the people, the outskirts of Xinjiang. Chinese. And there are the people who actually was the Chinese who were assisting the British to attack Xinjiang. They came from other provinces and from other places. They were they were former bandits. They were they were the former salt salt merchants guards. They were including some of some of whom were officials of Qing Dynasty, which is puzzling me. But they joined the British army. I think this is something that I consider to be rare because I, I have the I consider them to be real information because I have the real materials to show, to indicate these things exist. And they were the people who also joined. And another part that I also covered after I've gone through the lengthy description of the of the suicide and mercy killing and looting is how these soldiers, British soldiers, the Chinese ordinary people, average people, how they interact after the battle was over. There was a kind of interaction between them. And during the interaction, a, a good example, let me give you a teeny bit of example that unexpectedly that I discovered, is that after the battle, when the British officer came to the town to meet the, of, the officials, of Chinese officials, in the in in the city, because when the battle was over, they kind of withdraw and 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 they come to meet with the officials of Chiching, Qing officials, and to talk about whatever it is. There were women. Remember, many women committed suicide, right? There were women who came out to see them, not to greet them, because of a curiosity. They they come out to see them. Not only see them, they also looked in the eyes of the officers as if nothing ever happened. The British officers say, think, or they wrote in the diary, had we done it differently, which means had we not invade the city in the way we did, we would have gotten those people's support. They might have welcome us as if we are the saviors of them. That's the British officers. The Chinese wrote in the diary how shameful these women were. They forgot they were just invaded. They committed suicide. This is the kind of thing that I discovered in the book and I wrote in the book. I hope it will interest my audience. Thank you so much for this brief intro. I think when I was reading part one, I was very impressed by uh, not just the content, but also the kind of the pace you were setting up. So we kind of read about Zhenjiang, the place uh, in uh, the history of China, and then we are kind of more reading more official negotiating uh, or kind of the backdrop of the war. war. And then we're kind of moving on, kind of building up to this third chapter, Invader and the Invaded. Suddenly, we start to see how um, individuals, ordinary people on both sides, the British soldiers or officers and Chinese women or Chinese um, looters or Chinese soldiers, how they experienced the exact happening of the war and also the aftermath of the war. 
I think this untold story. That you reviewed in this chapter is impressive, is important, but also、um, very so touching for me,、uh, and I hope our audience would enjoy that as well.、Um, and then we kind of read this very. Dramatic and also traumatic experience happening to the local small city of、um, Zhenjiang, and then while、well, the war was over, the、uh, life went on.、Um, in the following part, we're kind of going back in time a little bit and revisiting, as you mentioned earlier, the river system transportation and. Commerce between north and south, south that Zhenjiang was,、uh, or the people at Zhenjiang was taking an active role. And here I want to focus on、um, chapter six, and、um, hope you could introduce to us a little bit more of how did those brokers active in Zhenjiang, who were traditionally trading with merchant groups from different parts of China. Connect to this new rising Shanghai Shanghai commercial network in the late nineteenth century, and what challenges did they meet, and how did these Zhenjiang brokers impact Shanghai's new business world? Okay, before I talk about that, let me just give a little bit of context. This book covers a period of time of roughly eighteen thirty nine to nineteen thirty seven. Which is nineteenth century, early twentieth century. So during this period of time, what I saw was that the beginning of the Opium War that got into Zhenjiang. But after the war, life went on in a sense. So I continue to examine what happened after the war was over and the British left. And life went on. What happened in the life in Zhenjiang? And when I studied this period of time, I discovered that Zhenjiang was kind of recovered quite quickly economically. It's not because the damage was small. It was because it was given the opportunity to recover. The opportunity was given by several things. One of which is the rise of Shanghai later. Actually, that will be by the late nineteenth century, as the as Shanghai was rising in China as one of the two most important economic centers, and then actually by the almost the eight. End of the nineteenth century, it will replace Guangdong to become the number one economic center of China. Then, by that time, it will, the economic center of China will become Shanghai and Hong Kong, in a sense. So, Shanghai becomes it's, it's kind of like a middle of China. So, it actually absorbs everything from middle China. Half I've done the research, so half of the economic activities go through Shanghai at the time. So, Zhenjiang, because it's close to Shanghai. Okay, all of a sudden was given the opportunity, but that's there is much more to what meets the eye, because it was not just the rise of Shanghai that mattered; it was the transformation of Chinese transregional trade that mattered, and actually, rise of Shanghai gave rise to that transformation to some degree, but the transformation took place by itself. Now this was what's happening. Why the brokerage? What does that have to do with anything? The old system of trade in China, the commercial system, was characterized by somebody whose name is G. William Skinner as the transregional trade. There were nine regions in China, each of which has its own core in the periphery. And each of which has its own major market, big city and medium-sized city and small city. But do they connect? They do. They connect through the long-distance trade, and there are what we call the trans-regional trade. However, there is one thing that is important: is that 
that was within the territory of the Qing Dynasty. That was the, within the territory of Chinese dynasties, Qing, Ming Dynasty, and before that. Now, there was, there was something else that I will talk about. Just in a second, I will talk about that. Now, during the period of time of the mid-19th century, it started to change. Because part of that, the rise of Shanghai. But when I talk about rise of Shanghai, I want to emphasize what I have researched in here is not just the Shanghai, when I use the term Shanghai commercial network, I do not mean it is a Shanghai and its adjacent cities that form a network of cities, like what we call the New York and, and the New York area and, 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 and metropolitan area. That's not what I mean. What I mean is this, is that centered in Shanghai, there was a network created by the people, the merchants, I'm going to mention that a little bit, is that what we call the merchant groups, the merchant groups. There were quite a few merchant groups and their activities spread through China. Very colorful, very, very, very colorful, very exciting stories about them. And my book actually covered quite a bit of them. Through the years, through all these years prior to 19th century and since the Tang Dynasty, they've taken advantage of the government dynasty policies, have established themselves in the country, have occupied the territories in a sense, all within the territory of Chinese dynasties. They have they've done all kinds of things and that created what we call the trans trans regional trade. And that system, that system for some some reasons had a one major connection. The connection is Xinjiang, is the place where I study. China, a country, and middle in the middle of that is the Yangtze River. Okay, Yangtze River. How the people from north of, of Yangtze River and south of Yangtze River connect, how they trade with each other. They don't travel all the way. Of course they do, but they don't. Most of them don't travel all the way from south to the north. Yeah, yes, they did because the Shangbangs and merchant groups they did that on purpose. But most of the traders and the smaller traders, medium-sized trade groups, and all these, and the representatives of of the merchant groups, they rather came to a place like a Zhenjiang. It's a meeting ground. It's intermediary place for them to meet and trade with each other. What's interesting, during the period of time, Zhenjiang saw itself play a role of a brokerage town. Many brokers emerged in Zhenjiang and they don't have to they don't have to do anything else. They don't have to really produce something or sell it to something. Actually Zhenjiang was the place that could not even support itself by growing enough rice. They have to buy rice from somewhere else. So many of these people rather become bro brokers, large brokers and medium brokers and smaller brokers and or many, many of them in there that created this city as a brokerage city, broke between the south and north of Yangtze River. What they broke for are the merchant groups and the merchant representatives who bought the stuff from north through them and brought the stuff to south and bring the, their, their, their merchants from commodities from south to Zhenjiang, sell it to the northerners north of Yangtze River. And so that's what they do. But when Shanghai gradually became prominent in Chinese econ economy, we have a problem. The problem is these people who used to come here don't come here anymore. Where did they go? They went to Shanghai. Why did they have to come here? They go to Shanghai. And Shanghai was, if anybody checked the location of Shanghai, Shanghai was not just on the ocean, Pacific Ocean, but also on, basically on the Yangtze River. So it has this unique location, even, even better than Xinjiang, that it connects China with the rest of Asia. That is the key. Remember, since the Ming Dynasty, Chinese 
kind of like took back its activities along the the the, the coast line, and decided not to contact any foreigners on the east coast. And during the Qing Dynasty, there were kind of relaxation of the kind of policy, and there were some kind of like opening up. Not really; it's half hazard. It can sort of like. Uh, opening up and re- not really did not really happen. Only until that period of time they actually opened, which means that they opened the coastline and they established what we call the treaty ports. Xinjiang became one of the treaty ports. Of course, when we talk about treaty ports, we're talking about major cities, Shanghai, Ningbo, Guangdong. This is like this on the east east coast of. But then they have a second secondary treaty ports that were really the river treaty ports, in a sense. So Xinjiang became one of them. But the question is that how Xinjiang reinvent itself if the people don't come here and the brokers lost their job. And what the Xinjiang wanted to do is that they have to reinvent themselves. What they did was that they tried to reconnect to Shanghai. What's fascinating, as I want to talk about, is that it's not just that they connected to Shanghai, the city. It's rather that they connect to the commercial network in Shanghai. Let me qualify just just a little bit of what I mean. There was a network in Shanghai created by the merchants, the Chinese merchants, created by the merchant network. That network was not just a city; it was a network of people who actually connected to Japan, Taiwan, Kongshu, and Korea. All these places in Asia, through that network, they brought things from England. For example, most of the cotton products that not I shouldn't say most; I said a great deal of the cotton products. For example, the Produced in England were brought to Shanghai first. Then these merchants brought to Japan, sold in Japan. I I based those analysis on the Japanese studies, and I found a lot of studies by the Japanese because they they they've shown in my book. I will talk about that. So during the period of time, the second part of this 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 part of research is to show that how Zhenjiang reinvent itself, not just by connecting themselves with the Shanghai. Commercial network, but also through the personal relations, how to become the second tier city that actually, when Shanghai sells a product, they sell it, they bring the product to Zhenjiang, Zhenjiang sell it to the people in countryside in north of Yangtze River. So that part of study that I I have done in the book. By the way, I I need to mention this that. Like you have mentioned, that even though it is a study of Chinese history, even though it is a study of historical experiences, I try to present everything as vivid as possible, so that when people read my book, I don't want them to think it's just a very dry social science science type of research. It is more of the narrative that tells those. Detailed stories about what happened. For example, I in this part of a book, I try to tell how the brokers brokers did their business. They wine, dine, provide post- prostitutes to the people who come to trade. They they cheat, lie, and they 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 play tricks on the the weighing system. They play tricks on. Everything that you might see in modern day, sort of like 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 a merchants that were doing in, in uh, most part of the world, uh, in a sense like that. Okay, all right. Yeah, that's very very fascinating and very fun to read. So how these、um, brokers, either small or running a kind of larger chain or franchised.、Um, Broker shops reinvented themselves as you were talking, or reconnected their business world to this rising new commercial network established or based at Shanghai.、Um, and moving on、uh, to the third part, that instead of a kind of traumatic war experience or this、uh, relatively.、Um, 
familiar experience of long term long distance trade. The third part、um, tackles something entirely new and humongous that emerged on the horizon for、uh, people at Zhenjiang. Well, it's a boat, but but a much、um, different boat, a steamboat specifically. So、um, here I want to connect or join chapter eight and nine together, and、um, ask Doctor John to. Explain a little bit more. How was this new foreign technology, steam navigation technology,、um, adopted or appropriated by different social groups in Zhenjiang? What kinds of opportunities and challenges this foreign technology have brought to the local society or the local people at Zhenjiang? Okay, one of the things that I found fascinating is this. As a person living in Zhenjiang, if we were studying history of Zhenjiang, let's imagine that we were living through the period of time with these people. Okay, there's a term that I, I like to use is ontological approach to history, which means that we tell the history as if we were the people living through the period of time, not just to tell the history in a conceptual narrative, which will be. More of a, an analytical approach. So, in order to do that, I try to present a story as much as I could experience it with these people. Think about these people who are living through this period of time, the nineteenth century and early twentieth century. Those things occurred to them like that. What occurred to us right now is all of a sudden we have TV, all of a sudden we have internet, and it's not by choice. It is. It's just that we caught up in this middle of this. Part of which is that during that period of time, people were all of a sudden bombarded by this what we consider to be the Western technology. Why do I use the word bombarded? Because It was a total surprise in the very beginning. They saw these boats going with the gunboat, whatever it is. And then later on, big steamship came. The Qing officials resisted adopting them, and people hated them because accidents. And believe it or not, every single steamship, if we use it long enough, will explode. It's the nature of that technology. But before it exploded, there were other things, accidents, because people are not familiar with it. Okay, there are so many accidents. Okay, but it was not just that. Because of the boat, it brought foreigners to Zhenjiang. On, if not daily basis, it will be weekly basis. There were always them. You can always see them. So that increased person to person contact between the Chinese and 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 those foreigners, and then gradually the local people decided that they were going to experiment with them. Of course, when we say local people, first the first group of people we have to think about is that the local relatively wealthy people. They're not super super wealthy, but they want to use the small steamboat to do business. They want to do that. They want to benefit from this. So all of these things that I've tried to understand showed us that during that period of time, people have to negotiate with this foreign technology. So I approach that from this perspective of how they negotiate the foreign technology. Why I use the word foreign, not just to say Western technology. Yes, it is Western. By the nature of technology, it is Western. But what I consider to be more important to me is that how this Western and foreign, which carries two connotations, one of which is that it is from from a foreign country. Secondly, it is totally different from what they have locally. How to negotiate with them? I want to have a broader implication of my study is that how. All societies negotiate with a foreign technology or to something that is totally foreign like this, because technology is kind of different from culture. Culture that can spread to a, a, a place in a different way, but 
technology, you see the impact immediately. For example, somebody holds a phone, iPhone in the hand. I've never seen the iPhone. I don't even know what it is. I remember when the recording was first came, somebody brought the recorder to China. They showed, they did scare them by saying that, do you know that somebody living in that little, little phone? So those kind of things happen to them. So how they negotiate? First, they try to adopt. They have gone through all this trouble trying to adopt this and uh, resistance from the officials. And and what what one of the difficulties they have to face is this: is that they wanted to make a little bit of money out of this, and they don't know how to deal with the technology. But on the other hand, uh, the Qing officials want to exploit them. They say, if you want to do this, I will levy the the tax. What they did, these people who wanted to ex- experiment with with the with the steamboat, they actually want to register with the British embassy and foreign embassy and and and, and give portion of, of 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 their stock to the foreign companies and, and in order to gain the recognition from them, so they can hang those. British flags and British identification sort of tag on their boat. Did you all of that? What What is interesting? I I've explained it in in the book is that eventually, in Zhejiang, at one point in time, people saw about two thousand Chinese boats carrying foreign flags, most of which are wooden junks that we have seen. In old China, as any other wooden boat in China, but they did the same thing. Carry all of that. Okay. Secondly, think about this. It was not just the boat that came in here. It was the accident that matters. Think about all of a sudden explosion happened on a boat, killed a lot of people. And and by the way, at the time, most of the people at the time, I do not know why, didn't know how to swim. It surprised me. They didn't know how to swim. When the accident occurred, most of these people were thrown into the river, Yangtze River, which is. I want people to have the idea: the Yangtze River is not just like a small river that we're talking about. It's a really big river, okay. And when you get into the Yangtze River. It, the chances of surviving is not very good. If you don't know how to swim, it's almost for sure that you're going to die, because it's very muddy, it's sandy. Okay, so especially in in, in springtime, it, it was uh, in fall, it was really treacherous. So many of these people died. When those things occur, what happened was that you have to settle them. In the past, it was the Qing officials versus the local people. Now, most likely, you have the Qing officials, the British embassy, the Japanese embassy. Why? Why these embassies? Because if a small boat, like I just have talked about, is that they, if they register with the British embassy, the British consider the British property. It's not just they got a flag, but also British will send people over there to say that, "Hey, this is our boat." So it become. Can you see that it become more of an international incident? It's then you have those complex relationship among the Chinese officials, the foreigners, the foreign embassies, and the Ch- Chinese people. I have many stories that I based on the local newspaper published at the time. Many, many of them. I also have the archives, documents to show what really occurred. I also examined how during the period of time the officials tried to settle those kinds of cases in which the accidents occurred and a lot of people died. And I want to see how the State and society relationship, in the sense of the the government and the ordinary people's life, were impacted by this. I also examined the rule of the state, which means the Qing officials, and I also examined the transformation of the rule be- between the Qing officials and warlords did not do much, and the nationalist government under Chiang Kai-shek. How the transformation of that occurs, I want to see that through this, what I consider to be the important cases. If you have 
the accidents, you have those important cases that actually touch the basic interest of the people and the lives of the people. And it also touches the interest of the government because the government wants to consider the controlling of the local society and the important task they have. And and similarly, this case is one of the things they have to do very carefully because they could upset the population. On the other hand, they wanted to have a massive impact on the society through settling those cases. So this part presents those kind of stories and those kind of details, okay, including the details of the person-to-person contact between the foreigners and the Chinese and average people in China and um, the foreigners who came here like American soldiers who all of a sudden jump off the boat and, 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 and those kind of things. And I hope that will interest my readers. Definitely. As Dr. Zhang was um, describing to us in this part, and and actually all through the books, um, you will find many interesting stories um, excitingly told, but also um, detailed, teased out how each um, episode or each theme connects to a larger historical happening in China or in the globe at the time or before and after. So it's a very interesting um, book to read by itself, but also important book to gain further knowledge about uh, this particular time or this particular theme or um, in general, what's the 19th century, 20th century world is um, doing or how the world in 19th century, 20th century is impacting a small or rather a medium-sized city in China. So as we already covered, this is really a very rich and dense book. However, is there anything that you had not included in a book that you would like to share with our audience? The conclusion of my book, I consider that the most exciting part out of my book, if anybody who is in the field of history, because I try to explain what I discovered. I try to give the meaning to what I discovered. For example, I try to explain why the suicides, why the mercy killings, what does that mean? And I try to present to people that the nature of war, any war, Okay, and I try to present to people that what occurred in Zhenjiang has some kind of implications to how we understand the war itself. So that's something I want to show it to people. And also the commercialization part. I try to show people in the conclusion that it's not just the city that caught up in the transformation. It was the entire commercial system that was in the midst of transformation. What I discovered was the part of that is the tip of the iceberg. And I hope that I have grasped that phenomenon, what we call the major transformation of Chinese commercial system. And I also try to conclude in the conclusion that this contact and this experience that we saw between the average people in China and the foreign technology is something today we can relate. We can still try to understand because today in this world, we are not just experiencing what we call foreign technology. It's the integration of technology in the world that is important to us. But for the average people, it is not necessarily a technology from a foreign country, but it's a technology that is new by itself is foreign to them. So I hope that my book has interest everybody. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. And uh, for all you have shared with us and also for writing such a wonderful, excellent, important book.
So what is your next step? What is your next plan? What are you working on now or、uh, your next project? Yeah, I am. I am. Now translating this book into Chinese right now, and it 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 will be published by Zhonghua Book Company, which is one of the most prestigious publishers in China. And I'm translating that. Actually, there will be a it 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 is in the process right now. There will be a, a another publication in the traditional Chinese by the Taiwan University Press, and it is in the process because Taiwan University Press is now just. Like today is contacting Harvard University Press to acquire the the translation rights, and 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 mainly China has got the simplified Chinese version、uh, publishing rights. Beyond that, I have been thinking quite a bit about a lot of things. I think one of the things I will move into is that it's not an announcement, but this this is the first time I mentioned that. But it has it's something a plan in making that I would like to give. Lectures to the American audience, if I have the opportunity to talk about China and to talk about my understanding of global life, global global change, and how that means to China, I would like to address those questions in the contemporary context, which means I'll talk about contemporary China and contemporary、uh, changes in in the United States and in the world. As for research part, I am still thinking because of a lot of material, I. Am thinking about whether I can do a comparison between countryside, which I my first book covered, and the medium-sized cities, which my second book covered. I have the materials for both of them, and my first book, if I if I allow me to mention that, is Social Transformation in Modern China, published by Cambridge University Press in two thousand. So I want to do some kind of things like this, and I am think still thinking about this. Thank you, Doctor John. It sounds so exciting that we have all these different fronts that、uh, all look forward to your further contribution. Chinese audience, or American、um, public, or、um, school students learning, or interested in about contemporary changes and Chinese reactions or adaptations to it, and also kind of further research. Products about、um, kind of comparison between, if I understand correctly, countryside and medium-sized cities、um, in a in、uh, amidst the nineteenth century, twentieth century global changes.、Um, that's very exciting, and I look forward to reading or hearing more、um, of what you can、uh, bring to us.、Um, and again, thank you so much for sharing all this. Uh, with us today,、um, if you're interested beyond this podcast, please look for the global in the local: A Century of War, Commerce, and Technology in China,、um, written by Dr. Xin Zhang and published 2023 by Harvard University Press. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Of course,、uh, thank you for sharing with us. And this is all for today.、Uh, look forward to. Talk to you again next time.